Talk to you. Recorded live. Hello, everybody, and those that will join in, um, those who will download in the future. Once again, we have uh, Jorg from Juggler66, and uh, we have another episode. Looks like we've got some interesting things to talk about. He's going to read some, uh, it looks like uh, from a short book. Um, but I will let him uh, share the details. Um, and for those who log in or who have logged in, if you look at that, I posted it's called remnantofgod.org, and that's what he'll be reading out of. Um, and with that, Jorg, I'm, I'll hand it over to you, my friend. Thanks, Michael. Thank and you. Um, thanks. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm very glad that I always uh, again get the opportunity to do another show with Julia on uh, on talk show. This is something uh, I wouldn't have dreamed of uh, about a year ago or whatever. Uh, you know, I I met Walt Stickel from Grand Design Exposed on. What funny date, 9-11, <laughs> 2013, <laughs> quite funny. And that was via Alan Lamont, and uh, from then on, it, it, it really took, uh, I, I took on another gear in my research and uh, in, in, my, um, in, in the things that I've got revealed uh, by, by the Holy Spirit, most of the all. And um, I'm, I'm very happy that I can do this work now with you here on this, on this platform, uh, I'm very happy that we have some listeners, uh, some people are live, some people downloading it afterwards, and I'm very glad for everyone who, who will join this. Uh, you know, I have announced for uh, quite some time that I was going to make another video on my uh, on my YouTube channel, Jobless66, Job um, and then uh, we went on this uh, via this discussion that we had uh, first you and me, and then later on another show uh, where we had uh, Wayne My uh, Michael Wayne as guest and uh, Tom Fress about the uh, hierarchy, the externalization of the hierarchy and the 10 points from the United Nations. Um, and now last weekend I finally did that video. Uh, I think, yeah, on Sunday I think I did it. And um, I also mentioned there that I also have uh, now um, 1 million views on my videos on my channel. Uh, which I don't say to, to clap my own shoulder, but uh, which I'm proud of, which I'm proud of because it's, it seems then that um, there are some things that I say or that I put out there are interesting for some people, and I hope that uh, well, not everybody of course who's going to watch a video, but uh, that a lot of people who watch these videos are led into the right direction and uh, finally led to Christ, because that is the intention that we have with this broadcast too, and I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, it, it is not um, <clears throat> for our own satisfaction that we do this year, but it is to do a right job. And uh, you know, uh, Jesus said, "Go out in the world and preach the gospel to every to every uh, to every creature." Um, well, I'm not a preacher. I cannot teach the gospel, but I, but I can tell the people the truth as far as I know it. And um, that is my motivation why I'm sitting here and doing this. And I hope uh, that will go on for a long time. Um, I just want to reflect on something uh, uh, guest two asked. Uh, what is my opinion on Freemasons and in particular the Shriner Oaths? Um, so what is my opinion on Freemasons? Well, actually, uh, last week when we did this broadcast with Tom Fress, uh, he mentioned something very interesting, and he said that Freemasonry is the Protestant arm of the Jesuits. I found that very interesting. That also, if you see it like that, like Tom explained at that time, um, makes absolutely sense why the Roman Catholic Church forbids priests and other people who are working for them to be a uh, member of a secret society or members of Freemasonry. It's not that Freemasonry works against the Roman Catholic Church, absolutely not, but they are trying to pull all the other people that they are working against there through Freemasonry into their kind of thinking and into their kind of brainwashing. So, um, my opinion on Freemasons is, of course, Freemasonry is, is not something that you can have an opinion on. Uh, Freemasonry is a religion. 
and you will understand that when you read or at least partly read the book from Albert Pike, Morals and Dogma, where it is absolutely stated that it is a religion. It is a Luciferian religion, not a satanic, not satanic, it's Luciferian. There's a quite difference between that. And what about the Shriner Oath? Well, I'm not so familiar with the Shriner Oath in itself. I can only say what I know about the Shriners is that the Shriners are Freemasons above the 33rd degree. Uh, when you are selected uh, in, in this group, then you become a Shriner. And I don't think that the Shriner's Oath is much different from the uh, Oath of Induction or the Fourth Vow uh, of the Jesuits. And that is something that we will catch up directly to, because I'm going to read that oath, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about it. But before, before I'm going to do that, I will repeat a little bit from a document that I uh, read already two or three broadcasts ago from this Belgian guy, Eric van Leeu, who lives here in Leuven, in the, the town where I live, here in Belgium, and he read um, a, um, a book or a work that is called uh, Change Readiness of a Religious Order, an Exceptional Organizational Story, uh, and uh, deals with the organization of the Jesuits, or let's say of the um, uh, Society of Jesus, as they like to call themselves. And um, I think this is very important just to do this before I do the reading of the Jesuit oath, because then you can understand a little bit the structure and the things that these people who are devoted to the Society of Jesus are going through and why they will take this uh, oath of induction even without thinking uh, a lot about that. So you have to understand that um, in everything that Jesuits do, a discerning element like uh, worked out methodolic, uh, uh, like worked out methodolic, methodology. Oh, sorry, that is a, <laughs> a long word for me. <laughs> methodologically, and the spiritual exercises plays a key role. So, spiritual exercises is maybe something you're not so familiar with, but that's something that uh, Ignatius and Loyola wrote even before the founding of the Jesuits uh, in the early 1530s. Uh, because the Jesuits were founded in, in 1534 and they just got papal acknowledgement in 1540. And um, this spiritual exercises, or uh, as today we are most confronted with uh, spiritual formation, is what is done everywhere. That is running through the media, that is running through our educational system, that is running through, our, uh, through the churches. Um, that is everywhere, everywhere we uh, encounter spiritual formation and um, that comes from the spiritual exercises. So uh, when you have the time, study that a little bit, what that is all about. But when you uh, check out our last broadcast that we did, uh, then you will also understand it a little bit because these 10 points from the United Nations from Ellis Bailey that we were talking about last week, that is all being done with the help of spiritual formation to take people away from God and put them to Lucifer and uh, or to Satan. Uh, and, you know, they are playing mind games with us. And I want to give you a little example. Um, a week and two, uh, almost two weeks ago, my, my son came to visit me and... Um, <clears throat> he told me that he was going to watch, uh, that he's going to uh, that he's watching a new television series on online on the PC. <clears throat> and he said, "Do you want to see it?" I said, "Yeah, okay. Just give me the first uh, the first uh, episode, and uh, we can look at that. Then at least I know what you're busy with." And <clears throat> we watched that, and that uh, television series is called Breaking Bad. I don't know if anybody heard about that. So it, it ran from 2008 until 2013. And um, I was quite impressed with that series, uh, not because I found it such a wonderful series, but because of the work that was done there to brainwash the people who watched this. And I couldn't stop watching it. Um, it's actually... Uh, it's a story about a chemical teacher who gets diagnosed with cancer, and because of that, he starts cooking meth, crystal meth. 
to earn money for his family that when he is dead that his family is provided for. That's his intention in the first place. And of course, when you start doing these things, things change in your brain and you're getting more and more accepted to things that you would not accept as a good person before that. So he's really breaking that and uh, his morals are really falling down. And that is why I watched this whole series. I'm almost done to the, to the last thing right now. But one, of the, uh, one very in, important thing hit me when I watched an uh, episode, I don't know, an episode from the season three um, where it dealt about contamination in the meth lab that he had. And the conversation came up, well, if you want to have real contamination, then talk about Ebola. Ah, uh, yeah, well, you know, this disease that comes in there from Western Africa and kills people and your, uh, your intestines fall out of your, gut, fall, fall, fall out of your stomach and, uh, and you're bleeding to death and all that stuff. Now we're talking about Ebola. Hmm. Now, Ebola is now in 2014 a high topic, but the point is season three was running in 2011. Do you see what I'm going to? Yeah, predictive programming. Yeah. It's yeah. like when now, after 9-11, you see the things that, for example, in 9-11, uh, in, in, in Terminator, in the, in the second Terminator movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, there is a scene where he gets pursued by the other Terminator in a truck, and he is himself is on a motorcycle and uh, going through a canal under a bridge, and above that bridge is a sign that states, Caution, 9-11. So when you see that movie in the 80s or, or begin 90s or so and whatever, and this is a very short scene, and you see that you won't even pay attention to it. But afterwards you say, well, why is there a sign saying caution 9-11? There were so many signs built in in other movies also about 9-11 that now afterwards we can say, oh, they are giving us signs here about what they are doing. Well, when I saw Breaking Bad and I saw this guy say about, uh, speak about Ebola, I said, wow. They're doing exactly the same thing because, you know, they could have talked about swine flu. They could have talked about bird flu. They could have talked about AIDS, HIV, about any virus, whatever they want to take. But in 2011, nobody in the world was thinking about Ebola, even though that was so uh, allegedly discovered in 1976 already. But it was absolutely, it was not on the screen. And they used this television series to talk about this, and um, the television series got quite successful. So a lot of people saw that. So people who saw that will remember that they some years ago already heard about Ebola. So their fear-mongering is even more successful. And this is spiritual formation. I think this is a plain example of spiritual formation. So, and everything Jesuits do, the discerning element, like worked out methodologically, is the spiritual exercises plays a key role. To continue in the text, when deciding which way to go, what structures and organization to put up, how to evaluate what has come, uh, what has been done, and where remediation or change is needed, Jesuits always use the discerning process as a guiding principle. The discerning process is present on all levels of the organization, individually and collectively. Jesuits live together in houses, not in monasteries, where they form communities. Sometimes their apostolic work is located in the same house, but most of the time this is not the case. They work in schools, colleges, universities, seminaries, cultural initiatives, uh, give retreats, minister in hospitals and parishes, promote social justice and ecumenical dialogue, and so on. Jesuits receive a long training or formation. And here the word comes back formation, spiritual exercises, spiritual formation. That can take up to 20 years. And I'm going to tell you what the classical traject trajectory looks like, but it's very important to state in the beginning of this broadcast that you understand that when you are in this training or formation that can take up to 20 years, you are 20 years constantly being under spiritual formation. By, med by meditation, by contemplative prayers, and all that stuff not to forget. And 
the trajectory, trajectory is very interesting because in the end, you will come out as a cadaver. Meaning, you're still living, but you're like a zombie. You don't have a mind of your own anymore. A Jesuit does whatever he's been told by his superiors without thinking of anything. They are like, maybe you can even say robots, you know? You give them an, you give them an order and they do that without even thinking. They are acting like a corpse. And we will come uh, that again also in the Jesuit oath, in the oath of the false vow, which is uh, very important that we go to later on. So when you want to see the classical trajectory, it starts like the two years of a novitiate. Here they find out whether their vocation is for real or not. So when you feel yourself called to be a Jesuit, you will first be given two years as a novitiate to find out whether your vocation is really for real. If you really, by heart, let's say, if you can say that, are devoting yourself to the Jesuit order and everything it embraces. Then afterwards, you have to do the first vows. A vow of poverty, a vow of chastity, and a vow of obedience. And here the novice becomes a scholastic. That means he is entering onto the path of priesthood. Or he becomes a Jesuit brother. And those are also known as temporal coadjutors. Very important word. So there is a splitting two ways that you go after the first two years and taking the first three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Whether you are entering on the path of priesthood or you become a temporal coadjutor. Now, when you're a scholastic, means entering into the path of priesthood, um, your education continues with two years of philosophy study. And then two years Regency means a full-time apostolic internship, if possible, in one of the Jesuit works. After these four years, you have five years of theology. University level, for example, here in Europe, because this is a European writer, he says that you can do in Paris, Madrid, Rome, or London. And after that nine years, you have an ordination. After the ordination, there are two options that are decided upon by Rome, not by you, what you want to do, but decided upon by Rome. First choice, the Jesuit priest is chosen for profession as a spiritual coadjutor. He takes vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Or, second, the Jesuit priest is chosen for profession as a professed of the four vows. The fourth vow is the vow of obedience to the Pope. And this is the most important part where they again part ways and this is the most important vow. You have to understand when you understand the society of Jesus as they are called them, as they call themselves that Ignatius of Loyola and um, Francis Xavier, the two guys who were really after the founding of the Jesuits in the 1530s, they went to the Pope before 1540. And introduced themselves and wanted to tell the Pope that they want to be a new order called the Society of Jesus and do actually work for the Vatican, work for the Pope. And the Pope didn't like the idea and he rejected them. And they came back, I don't know how much time later, but I think it was a year or something or even more. And by that time, Ignatius of Loyola introduced to the Pope, but hey, we will not be just an order which takes the normal three vows that I have just read to you here in the document, but we will even submit to you under a special fourth vow. The professed of the four vows and the fourth vow is the vow of obedience to the Pope especially. And this fourth vow we are going to read within a few minutes. So here you have the story how that comes to it and how it came to it. And only after Ignatius of Loyola declared this vow to be taken by any Jesuit to the Pope, the Pope agreed in founding the Jesuit order in 1540 by a papal bull. 
So to go further with the education, you have then after that five or uh, five to six years apostolic work or additional studies, one year tertianship, a third year of novitiate, and after this year the Jesuit priest takes the final step by effectively taking vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and if chosen for profession as a professed of the four vows, obedience to the Pope, so an extra false vow, the same vow that I was just talking about. And then afterwards, the final vows, the general superior invites the Jesuit to pronounce perpetual vows of poverty, chastity, obedience, and some are invited to also pronounce the fourth vow of obedience to the Pope. So I'm done reading this document right now, uh, but I thought that would be interesting to repeat that a little bit from our last broadcast. And um, now, Michael, have you any questions on this, or shall I really continue now with the Jesuit oath already, with the vow of the induction, the fourth oath? Okay, no question. So I'm going to continue, and I'm going to read to you what the Jesuit takes as the what I just called <clears throat> um, as a professed. Jesuit of the four vows, the obedience to the Pope, the Jesuit oath. <sighs> Quote, my son, heretofore you have been taught to act the dissembler among Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic and to be a spy even among your own brethren, to believe no man, to trust no man, among the reformers to be a reformer, among the Huguenots to be a Huguenot, among the Calvinists to be a Calvinist, among other Protestants generally, generally to be a Protestant, and obtaining their confidence to seek even to preach from their pulpits, and to denounce with all the vehemence in your nature our holy religion and the Pope, and even to descend so low as to become a Jew among Jews that you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. You have been taught to plant insidiously the seeds of jealousy and hatred between communities, provinces, states that were at peace, and to incite them to deeds of blood, involving them in war with each other and to create revolutions and civil wars in countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and the sciences and enjoying the blessings of peace, to take sides with the combatants and to act secretly with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that which you might be con connected, only that the church might be the gainer in the end, and the conditions fixed in the treaties for peace, that the end justifies the means. You have been taught your duty as a spy to gather all statistics, facts, and information in your power from every source, to ingratiate yourself into the confidence of the family circle of Protestants and heretics, of every class and character, as well as that of the merchant, the banker, the lawyer, among the schools and universities, in parliaments and legislatures, and the judiciaries and councils of state, and to be all things to all men for the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. You have received all your instructions heretofore as a novice, a neophyte, and have served as coadjurer, confessor, and priest, but you have not yet been invested with all that is necessary to command in the army of Loyola in the service of the Pope. You must serve the proper time as the instrument and executioner as directed by your superiors, for none can command here who has not consecrated his labors with the blood of the heretic. For without the shedding of blood, no man can be saved. Therefore, to fit yourself for your work and make your own salvation sure, you will, in addition to your former oath of obedience to your order and allegiance to the Pope, repeat after me. End quote. 
Michael, I'm going to um, stop reading here for a moment so that we can uh, together discuss a little bit of the things that I just, uh, just went through. Is that okay for you? That's fine. Yeah? Because I think some things need a little bit more explaining, you know? Um, in the beginning, he says, um, among the reformers to be a reformer, among the Huguenots to be a Huguenot, among the Calvinists to be a Calvinist, among Protestants generally to be a Protestant. And obtaining that confidence to seek even to preach from their pulpits. Now, this is exactly what Alberto Rivera was all about. Alberto Rivera, the former Jesuit priest who found Jesus Christ, got saved, and, um, and then uh, revealed a lot of Vatican secrets to the public, like uh, the Vatican connection to the Islam, to the founding of Islam, and things like this. He was educated in that way to infiltrate the Protestant churches of the United States of America to bring them back under the wings of Rome in that time. Mm -hmm. And to preach from their pulpits, well, that says you even have to go up there and, and teach what they think, but just to you, you use your own intelligence and turn the world around without them even knowing it. Yeah? That's how they get you. And to denounce with all vehemence in your nature our holy religion and the Pope, and even to descend so low as to become a Jew among Jews. Well, this is a very interesting part of the Jesuit oath because there are so many people, even today, who say the Jesuits are Jews. Well, um, there was a time that Jews were forbidden in the army of uh, uh, in the army of uh, of the Jesuits, but. Um, I don't know the exact date anymore, but we read that some weeks ago in our broadcast here. Uh, that was also in the uh, in the uh, in, in the text from this uh, from this Belgian Jesuit that I just read from. Um, there somewhere it, it, it stood in at what time um, that law was taken away. But um, to say that the Jews are running the Jesuits is very wrong. But to understand this false vow and then to see that the Gentiles who are in this Jesuit organization uh, even descend so low to become a Jew among Jews, well, that explains a lot. That people just say they are Jews and they are not. And I think you had uh, a broadcast some time ago where you spoke about these Ashkenazi Jews and all this stuff. Oh, yes. Yeah? It was recently Sunday. Yeah, so you dealt a little bit with it. So why don't you give me your, your opinion on this? Well, the Jesuits infiltrated the Jews, the Jewish movement, via the Ashkenazi Jews. Ashkenazi Jews are not biological Jews. There's two, like you brought up, there's two types of Jews. There's those who, there are very few that remain. About 3% of all the call themselves Jews are actually biological Jews. The rest of them, the 97% are actually just religious-based Jews, you know, they join the religion. What the Jesuits have done, and all major religions, is they've infiltrated them, and they've taken over the leadership. And, it's, and so whether it's the what we call the Zionists, or we call Israeli Jews in, in Israel, the Jesuits actually are running the show there. And that's well documented and established. There's enough evidence to support that claim, all you do is just do a little bit of research, and that, yeah, so so what we're looking at in Israel is another of one of the, the, the Jesuits' machinations. I think it's, under, it's important for people to understand, first of all, who the Jesuits are, and we were talking about that right now, but who they are today. They have completely and utterly taken over the Roman Catholic Church, in particular the hierarchy, and Ever since 1798, with the fall of the papacy, uh, they have taken over that, the role of control and running the papacy and the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. And in process, and rein in all the other churches, they've taken over the hierarchy of all the major Protestant religions, the, the, the major uh, Jewish religions, 
the major Islamic religions. And one of the tools they've used to do that is through Freemasonry and the Shriners, as we talked about earlier. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, so the point that if this is the, the thing is, is that there, there are men out there claiming to be Jews that are playing the role of being J- Jews who uh, first allegiance is actually to Rome, the papacy, Roman Catholicism. Um, and we have to understand that. So, and it's not to say that everybody who's Jew, obviously, is a, a Jesuit or a Freemason or a Zionist. There's um, an awful lot of Jewish folks who are totally against the Zionist state of Israel, uh, who recognize what it really is, what it's all about. So, um, I don't know if that helped at all. <laughs> Could go into more detail, but it's, if you want to learn more about it, folks, you go back to Sunday's show, or you know, I think the show is called uh, "Should We Support the State, the Zionist State of Israel, or the State of Israel?" And you can look into that. Plus, I, I posted on there uh, at ChristianityBeliefs.org and Time Deception. If you look under there, they, 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 this, this gentleman has done a masterful job of uh, articles explaining in more detail the whole charade that's over there. And, uh, you know, as folks who are believers in Christ, we should also have a lot of sympathy for those true, first of all, the true Jews that are out there that are being exploited. Those that think they're, you know, that they're doing God's will uh, by perpetuating this atrocity that's going on in the Middle East, we need to pray for them that they may come to the realization of what's happening to them is no good's going to happen. And in the end, part of the goal, if you look at uh, Albert Pike, Morals of Dogma, along with others, and their research, who are an in, in, in inside crowd, if you will, the goal of this third world, this uh, third world war that they're creating is to actually get rid of, annihilate the majority of the Jews, along with most people, Bible-believing Christians, a whole lot of Muslims, and if it and if it costs, you know, uh, bil- you know, billions of people's lives to do it, they're going to do it. So and there's a reason is because they want to have this create this one world religion, a Luciferian religion, where everybody will bow down and, and worship the image of. Uh, the Antichrist, if you will, or it's, uh, a more particular Satan or Lucifer. So, and uh, I know uh, that's about all I'm going to say about that for now. So, you still there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm still there. I was, Did it run you away? <laughs> no, 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 no. I was, I was listening, and um, I was seeing if I could look up a web page that I uh, looked at this afternoon uh, when I was uh, preparing for our broadcast right now, um, and that had to deal with uh, something in um, uh, in Israel, uh, and that was an article by uh, his his last name was Chamish. Uh, oh yeah, Chamish. Yeah, yeah. He's done a lot of. He has his own show and. He's written books and all that kind of stuff. On on First Amendment Radio, right? I don't know if he's still on or not, but I know he, no, was. he was. He was there. I mean, yeah, he was yeah. there. That's for sure. But I can't seem to find this um, this, uh, this link anymore. Uh, I, have, I have to look that up because uh, I, I just wanted to say that about where we are going here, where we are talking now here about, uh, about this Jews uh, subject, it would be interesting to... Um, to have a look at that, uh, it's, it's this ah, the Vatican's plot against Israel. I have it right here. Yeah, okay. um, that will take us a little bit away from from the oath, but we're going to continue in that. But um, um, I, this Barry Charmish, Barry Barry, Barry Charmish or Barry Charmish is his name, and um, this is um, Save Israel, Chapter Four: The Vatican's Plot Against Israel, and I think. Just when you see it uh, among that, what we are talking about in this oath of induction that I was just that I just read, 
and then you see it in, in, in that uh, connection that it's very interesting. So I'm going to read a little bit from that article. And that starts, of course, with, uh, with, with a lot of people are denying still that um, with the Oslo Accords in 1993, uh, Shimon Peres signed over 60% of uh, Jerusalem to the Vatican. And that is in the beginning dealing this document with that. Uh, in March 1994, the newspaper Kadashot revealed a most remarkable secret of the Middle East peace process. A friend of Shimon Peres, the French intellectual Marek Halter, claimed in an interview that in May 1993, he delivered a letter from Paris to the Pope. Within, Paris promised to internationalize Jerusalem, granting the United Nations political control of the old city of Jerusalem and the Vatican hegemony of the holy sites within. The United Nations would give the PLO a capital within its new territory, and East Jerusalem would become kind of free trade zone of world diplomacy. Halter's claim was backed by the Italian newspaper La Stampa, which added that Arafat was apprised of the agreement and it was included in the secret clauses of the Declaration of Principles signed in Washington in September 1993. In March 1995, the Israeli radio station Arutz Shiva was leaked a cable from the Israeli embassy in Rome to Peres' foreign ministry in Jerusalem confirming the handover of Jerusalem to the Vatican. This cable was printed on the front page of the radical left-wing Israeli newspaper Haaretz. Two days later, a scandal erupted and numerous rabbis who had invited Paris for Passover services canceled their invitations in protest of his treachery. Peres re reacted by claiming that the cable was real, but that someone had whited out the word not. The cable said, that Israel would not hand Jerusalem over to the Holy Pontiff. Illustrating the sorry political state of Israel's rabbis, they accepted this cockamamie excuse and re-invited Paris to their tables. However, in the widely distributed minutes of a meeting with Clinton in 1997, Perez reiterated his diplomacy, ending with the words, quote, as I had previously promised the Holy See, end quote. I'm not going to read this article any further right now, but uh, I will put this in the chat box of our broadcast that people can read it for themselves. And I found this very interesting when you see that in regard to the Jesuit oath that we were just uh, talking about. To even descend so low to become a Jew among the Jews, you know? Um, and the oath continues that you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. Gather information. Dear listeners to the show, in, gather information. What are the so-called intelligence agencies in the United States of America called the CIA, the NSA, the FBI for a part, um, the Mossad, the MI5, the MI6, the BND, all these intelligence agencies are Jesuit controlled and are under the direction of the Superior General of the Jesuits. And here you have it even in their oaths. Yeah? Yep. <laughs> to gather together all information. So that's what an intelligence agency is all about. An intelligence agency is about to gather information. Now what does the NSA do? With their spying on us on the internet, with their spying on us on our cell phones and all the other telephones, emails, everything that we do, that is gather information. So this old may be 500 years old almost, but still it is absolutely up to date. For the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. Here you have the first allegiance to the Pope in the oath. 
You have been taught to plant insidiously the seeds of jealousy and hatred between communities, provinces, states that were at peace, and to incite them to deeds of blood, involving them in war with each other. Now, this is exactly what we have seen since the Counter-Reformation. All these wars that were planned on countries who were prospering from the Reformation, who were establishing a middle class that was formerly in the Dark Ages unknown. People were prosperous. And there are numerous examples. Uh, I, I, can, I can only give you one very simple example, and I think that says it all. Tell me how many Muslims have ever received a Nobel Prize, whether it's in chemicals, in mathematics, in physics, I don't know, whatever science, how many Muslims have ever received a Nobel Prize? On the one hand, and on the other hand, how many Nobel Prizes were reached out to countries that were at least at a time, Protestant countries. What were the industrial revolution that kicked in from the 1830s on, where did that start? In Protestant England, right? And it continued in Protestant Germany. And it continued in Protestant United States of America. Even though it wasn't that Protestant anymore, we know now when we study the founding of 1776, which was the end of Protestant America, but it was still under a veil. Rome was still under a veil in the United States of America. And America has done a lot in, in the coming, in, in the last years of uh, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, with electricity and all that stuff, I mean, all that came a lot from Nikola Tesla, something else, but also the oil industry developing, developing that and all that stuff. I mean, America has its part in that, Germany has its part in there. Just think of the car uh, that was invented by Daimler, um, the guy from Mercedes Benz. Think of the uh, internal combustion engine from uh, Otto, that was a German. Think of the diesel engine from Rudolf Diesel, that was a German. So these were all Protestant countries. These were all countries that had freedom and that enjoyed peace. Not every time, not, not always, not all the time through, but for a big part of the time, they enjoyed that. And I don't know many Muslims who have a Nobel Prize or invented anything of interest? <laughs> so, this is, for me, a very good example that once you have a little bit a country that is prospering in whatever, and you send Jesuits in, well, they will make sure that it's, uh, that it's done with that. Uh, and that is, of course, because they hide all the important technology. You know, there is so much technology hidden from us, I can't even sum it up right now. Cars running on water, cars running on air, uh, free engines uh, that can warm your house with, with heat, that can heat your water in your house uh, by free energy without any pollution, of anything, but this is all kept from us because there's no money in it. And only when you have money in the world and you control the money of the world, you have control over the people. And when you control the money and you control the food chain and you control the politics, well, then there's nothing else for you as a um, as an individual to control over, is there? Hmm. And then you will enjoy the dark ages. And that's what um, the rule of the Pope is all about. Well, yeah. The 
food chain, and let's don't forget that they also in the history, in the past, the air. Even in England and in Western Europe, there are examples of the past going back 300 years and prior where they literally tax people for breathing the air. Having the right to breathe air. Mm. And uh makes you wonder with all the geo and engineering going on and all that, not how much of that will be part of the old scenario. Well, if we go further in these oaths, we come to the part where it says, act secretly with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side. When you follow a little bit of world politics, this is um, just the point that it's all about, you know. Putin is controlled by the Jesuits. Obama is controlled by the Jesuits. Assad is controlled by the Jesuits. Netanyahu is controlled by the Jesuits. Right. When they play in the media an argument or whatever, it's just the puppets hanging on the string saying the things that they have to say, but the puppet master behind them is always a Jesuit. And one is mainly engaged on the other side. It doesn't matter. Everybody has his agenda, but ultimately it leads all to that that when one actor is controlled by a Jesuit and the other actor is controlled by the Jesuits, the only connection they have is they're both connected by Jesuits. And Jesuits always work for only one goal. And that is only that the church might be the gainer in the end. And that the end justifies the means, as stated in the oath here. So when you read something and this is especially for listeners here in Europe, and you think, oh, yeah, they are going so much against Russia right now and with this Ukraine stuff, and oh, they always put Russia as the bad guy, blah, 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 and that's not true. Wake up. Russia plays the bad guy because it's told to play the bad guy, and it's going to play the good guy when, when, when it's told to be the good guy, or China, or whatever. They are all Jesuit controlled. It's all just a theater. And, I mean, it just comes into my mind. I don't know if you know. Have you ever heard of the allegory of the cave, Michael? Of course. From Plato? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, man. This is some interesting stuff. And if you have never heard of the allegory of the cave, maybe we can go in a broadcast in that one time. I think it would be a very good broadcast, uh to read it and discuss it because that's what we're all dealing with, especially a gentleman like yourself and I and, and others who wake up and then try to warn everyone else. <laughs> but who has not heard of it yet, for who has not heard of it yet, I will provide the link in the chat box of our broadcast here. And then you can read it for yourself, Plato's Cave. And that is a very interesting subject that we should really turn to one time. And... I mean, okay, you can read this just with oath and you can actually go on it for hours and hours and hours, you know, because it goes so deep. It has so much meanings. And it, it, it tells you so many things. Oh, yeah. um, Once you understand the oath, then you could go a perfect example, folks, would be then study what's going on in Ferguson, and you're going to find out that Jesuits are behind the whole thing. We read, George read earlier how they foment revolutions and pitting groups of people against each other, well, that's what they're doing in Ferguson. So. Absolutely. Ferguson is for them just another playground, like um, you had um, uh, New Orleans after Katrina. Yeah. That was the first time that they tried to go into the houses and take the guns of the American citizens. Yeah, that's, that's a issue, that's a big motive, but it's deeper than that. You can understand St. Louis is a, uh, just like uh, Brooklyn, or excuse me, Baltimore, or Washington, D.C., These there are certain cities in this country that are enclaves for the Jesuits, and St. Louis is. And then this goes back to Albert Pike, and then you go to Father D. Smith, who was located in St. Louis, 
And there's been all sorts of problems in this country stemming out of that city. In particular, it's Jefferson City, which is uh, right next to it, or suburb of St. Louis. And um, they just go into all this, the, the details. It would be a whole show in itself, but it's just needless to say, there is a, uh, a logical reason why it's coming out of uh, St. Louis. And in order to know what that logical reason is, you have to study the Jesuits and their influence in this country and their role in St. Louis. And, uh, and I mean, from Father Smith, it, it was a central location. He was able to uh, uh, communicate with Albert Pike, the, uh, the founders of the Mormon faith, so that they can move out west and settle the west. And it goes on and on and on. So... Mm-hmm. So but we'll go back. I'm sorry, I started to digress a little bit. Yeah, no, no, no problem, no problem. I'm, I'm just, I'm just uh, reading here. Guest two tells uh, says that he's watching uh, Breaking Bad from the starting pilot season one. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, that was one thing that I missed to say. I, I told you about this Ebola stuff, right? And how they work the spiritual formation, but they're even they're even worse. They are so bad with series like this, and this is a prime example. So when you watch the series. Take a heed. They make you feel for the bad guy. Yep. They make you vote for the bad guy. He kills people. He kills children. And they make you feel sorry for him mm-hmm. and feel with him. And you want him to survive. It's really, that's what they do when you watch the series. It comes so blatantly. And that is exactly what the, what the Jesuits do. When my superior tells me black is white and white is black, that's the way it is. And we will come to that a little bit further here in this oath. You will accept good for bad and bad for good. They turn the values around. They turn the moral around. Now, when you, like, I'm not better than you all listeners here, but I am awake, I am aware of these politics. And that's when I watched this series that I was aware of it. I only stood there in awe how they succeeded in pulling you into this and voting for the bad guy. I didn't vote for the bad guy. I'm only waiting for him to die. <laughs> but the point, yeah, but the point is they turn it around that way that you really are feeling for him. When actually you should say, oh my God, what a bad man. Why doesn't this come to an end? Well, it reminds me of uh, the song Sympathy for the Devil yeah. and how they create this, this sympathy uh, for their satanic agenda. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, if you realize, you know, once again, the Jesuits, I mean, you know, this, it's annoying as all get out when you realize that they really are under every rock and yeah. their involvement in the drug trade and I think this is, this is just a, a prime example of spiritual formation. Absolutely. How you can turn the minds of people around. When, when you look at another television series, Desperate Housewives, you know yeah. that one? Yeah, well, yeah, justifying and That's uh, exactly the celebrating same thing. adultery. You know, they, put, they, put, they put sexy women in there and uh, do a little bit of show around that, and then it all turns into something dark. There is killing involved, poisoning, uh, I don't know, uh, any kind of, of, of death uh, involved in this, in this Desperate Housewives. I, I watched this series also. And that is exactly the same thing. You always you start to vote for the bad guys because, okay, you killed that guy, but he had a reason. He had a reason, you know. <laughs> and that's the way they, they, they do this insidiously in their work in your subconscious. Ah, uh, really, I'm, I'm, I'm just in awe when I, when I read about this. And, and, and when I read this, out, it all just brings it back to me. It all makes it so clear. And it all makes it so clear why, uh, how they take us away from our God, how they take us away from Jesus and from the truth and from reading the Bible and studying the Bible and from just loving my neighbor as much as I love myself. Yeah. And when you understand that Millions and millions of people are watching this series that I just spoke about and all the other series. And I haven't even started of Hollywood movies because that's just the same. 
I mean, when you when you watch the first Roberto Stallone movie in the eighties, Rambo, first Love, I think it is called. Who wasn't on the side of Rambo when he killed all the guys? Sure, uh, and it's the same. It's the same brainwashing there, and they use it still today. And now you have to understand that. I mean, Michael and I, we maybe have a little bit of the advantage of being a little bit older than 20 years already right now, but when you are, like my son, 22, and have been growing up with all this blasphemy and false morals and dogmas and lies, and then you don't see through it. Then you just don't see through it. I have tried to awaken my son many a times. I have given up. I have tried many a times, but I didn't succeed because he is so brainwashed into this spiritual formation that he just don't see it. Yeah, which goes back to guess too. You know, hopefully you're not serious. You're not going to waste your time watching this episodes or this show. It's not going to do anything. It's not going to redeem you, anything redeeming, and it won't. No, no. You will not learn anything great about life. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, he's not going to learn anything great about life. But maybe he sees the way that the Jesuits are working through mind control by doing these theories and can teach other people from the lessons he learned from that. So, you know, I will not advise not to watch it, but I will advise to George, watch it. With an you open can eye. find that. You can find that plenty of examples where you don't have to waste a whole bunch of time in your life, your precious time in this life, with all the different videos in, in the Internet. No, no, that's right. But, you know, when still you want to watch that, then still watch it with an open mind and see the deception behind that. Yeah. And when you see that, then you have at least something learned from it. And that is the most important part. I mean, when, when they show you the evil and you can learn something from it, you can you can identify the evil in it afterwards, then you have learned. Yes. But you shouldn't have to watch the whole series to figure that one out. No, you don't have to watch it. <laughs> Five you, should be able, no. you should be able to watch one series, one show episode and start figuring it out. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I those two particular, House, Best for Housewives and, um, and Breaking Bad, I just found unpalatable. I just would watch a little bit of it and it's like, this is, Pure evil, and this is before I was even surrendered to the Lord and even believed. I mean, I was just a worldly man that was just, you know, you know, living my own life and doing my own thing. But I watched that and I go, my goodness, they're celebrating some guys a drug dealer killing people. You know, it's look half demon possessed, and then you got the desperate housewives and they're what they do? They're fornicating and committing adultery and glorifying it. And they got these women that look like total bimbos. And I'm thinking to myself, we're whacked. We're just one of the most whacked out societies that has ever been created. And, you know, it talks about in the Bible, too, it talks about the sorcery in the mm -hmm. end days and revelations and how they would use sorcery to gain their great wealth. And that's what all that is, folks. It's all sorcery to mess with your minds, to corrupt you, and keep you from studying the truth, reading the Bible, and uh, figuring out what really is going on. And it just plays with our loss. And, and, and it's deliberately there to, not to educate you, but to dumb you down. So if you, want to waste, if you want to waste your life watching the whole series, go for it. Knock it out. Knock yourself out. But I wouldn't. <laughs> I don't recommend it myself. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. I'm continuing in the oath here. All right. Uh, next very interesting part is to ingratiate yourself into the confidence of the family circle of Protestants. The family circle. And what we were talking about when we were talking about this document from Alice Bailey, the externalization of the hierarchy, that was that one of their goals is to break up the family circle. So integrate yourself in the family circle, then you can break it up. Uh, you do that with the merchant, the banker, the lawyer, among schools and universities, and that's where you find all, all, the, all the Jesuits, of course, in parliament and legislatures and the judiciaries and state of council, and council of state. 
and to be all things to all men for the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. You don't even need to read any further in these oaths to understand what it's all about. For the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. It says it all, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. But now you have to understand, this is just for the starting. So this would be when he takes the fourth vow after the first ten years that I just read. When you have this ordination, the Jesuit priest is chosen for profession as a professor of the, vow, uh, of the four vows. And the fourth vow is the vow of obedience to the Pope. Then he is uh, in giving this oath. And the oath that we are reading right now uh, is going to continue because it says in the end here, therefore, to fit yourself for your work and make your own salvation sure, you will, in addition to your former oath of obedience, to your order and allegiance to the Pope, repeat after me. And then comes the second part of the oath. And this is the most important part of the oath. So this first part, the, the special obedience of the Pope, is something they say already before that. And now comes the most important part of this Jesuit oath of the fourth part. And I'm going to read the text right now, and um, we can analyze it afterwards, if it's all right with you, Michael. I try to read it in one, in one part, okay? Quote, I, and now the name of the Jesuit, now in presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed Saint John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles, Saint Peter and Saint Paul, and all the saints, sacred host of heaven, and to you, my ghostly father, the superior general of the Society of Jesus, founded by St. Ignatius Loyola in the pontification of Paul III and continued to the presence, do by the womb of the Virgin, the matrix of God, and the rod of Jesus Christ, declare and swear that His Holiness, the Pope, is Christ's vice-regent and is the true and only head of the Catholic or universal church throughout the earth and that by the virtue of the keys of binding and losing given to His Holiness by my Savior Jesus Christ, He hath power to to depose heritable kings, princes... uh, Sorry, no, I I left a line there, right? I I sprang a line there. Uh, Catholic or universal church throughout the earth, and that by the virtue of the keys of binding and losing given to His Holiness by my Savior Jesus Christ, He hath power to depose heretical kings, princes, states, commonwealths, and governments, and they may be safely destroyed. Therefore, to the utmost of my power, I will defend this doctrine and His Holiness's right and custom against all usurpers of the heretical or Protestant authority, whatever, especially the Lutheran Church of Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, and the now pretended authority and churches of England and Scotland, and the branches of some now established in Ireland and on the continent of America and elsewhere, and all adherents in regard that they may usurp and heretical, opposing the sacred mother church of Rome. I do now denounce and disown any allegiance as due to any heretical king, prince, or state, named Protestant or liberal, or obedience to any of their laws, magistrates or officers. I do further declare the doctrine of the churches of England and Scotland, of the Calvinists, Huguenots, and others of the name of Protestants or Masons to be damnable, and they themselves be damned who will not forsake the same. I do further declare that I will help, assist, and advise all or any of His Holiness's agents in any place where I should be, in Switzerland, Germany, Holland, Ireland, or America, or in any other kingdom or territory I shall come to, and do my utmost to extirpate the heretical Protestant or Masonic doctrines and to destroy all their pretended powers, legal or otherwise. I do further promise and declare that, notwithstanding, I am dispensed with to assume any religion heretical for the propagation of the Mother's Church interest, 
to keep secret and private all her agents, counsels from time to time, as they entrust me, and not to divulge directly or indirectly, by word, writing, or circumstances, whatever, but to execute all that should be proposed, given in charge, or discovered unto me by you, my ghostly father, or any of his sacred or of this sacred order. I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion or will of my own, or any mental reservation whatever, even as a corpse or cadaver, perinde ac cadaver, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope and of Jesus Christ. That I will go to any part of the world, whithersoever I may be sent, to the frozen regions north, jungles of India, to the centers of civilization of Europe, or to the wild haunts of the barbarous savages of America, without murmuring or repining, and will be submissive in all things, whatsoever is communicated to me. I do further promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly and openly, against all heretics, Protestants, and Masons, as I am directed to do, to extirpate them from the face of the whole earth. Hey, and hey, hold on a second. Yeah? You know you're reading, actually, the Knights of Malta's and the Knights of Columbus both? They're all just the same? No, they're not. The reason I can tell is because you're bringing up... The, the, their, this is the unique difference. They, they all serve the same master. The unique difference in their oath is that the Knights of Malta and the Knights of Columbus swear an oath to uh, tackle or take over the Masons. Read that again, what you said about he's, he's about the Masons. Yeah. Secretly and openly against all heretics, Protestants, and Masons, as I am directed to do, to extirpate them from the now, face of all earth. And now in a Jesuit, Jesuit, actual official Jesuit's oath, it only pertains to the quote-unquote Jesuits. It actually says that uh, secretly or openly against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals. So just to let you know the difference. And it is, there is a, 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 it's a, it's a slight difference, but it's an important difference. Because with the Knights of Malta and the Knights of Columbus, they were specifically designed to usurp and take over the Masons. They control the Masons. Then it goes to, from there to the Jesuits, to the Jesuit generals. So, my uh, point is that, is, is, is that is that there is two separate oaths. The Knights, the Knights of Columbus, are just another arm of the Knights of Malta, right? No, actually, there are two separate military orders. Yeah, uh, but but the Knights it, of Columbus are uh, inferior to the Knights of Malta. I read that today somewhere even. So that's why I know that. Well, the Knights of Columbus... And the point, about, the point about the Masons you do is right, but, you know, I have read uh, several of these oaths already, and um, now that you say it with the Masons, yeah, it, uh, normally it reads like the Liberals. Right. But um, the source that I took this oath from reading from is from uh, Alan Lamont's blog spot. Hey, so uh, the thing he normally is very, 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 uh, very sure about the things that he prints in there. But I, I maybe should have taken it from um, uh, from uh, our friend uh, Nicholas. Right. It's it's not really that picky. I'm not being picky either because now we got the now we talk about we talked a little bit about the Masons and the different oaths of the Knights of Columbus and Knights of Malta, but then liberals and defining what they mean by liberals. Because it's not just, you know, uh, atheist or free-thinking people. Guess who else is involved in, in that group of liberals? That, yeah, I know, I know, that, I know. That is the, that's that's okay, Catholic, okay. That's, that's the Catholic church in this country and in other countries where they well, that's, that's diminish okay. the Pope and they don't bring them, they bring them, they, they, you know, they don't believe everything that he says. If you're a Catholic and you do not believe everything that the papacy or the Pope says, you're considered a liberal. 
So. Yeah, with, with, with the Masons, you're right. But that's okay. I'm, uh, I'm just going to change. I'm going to read it uh, now from, um, from Nicholas' side. Uh, and there's the right one with the liberals, I see. So I okay. just repeat the, the last part. I'm not yeah. trying to correct you. I'm just no, 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 no. But, but you're, right. But you're right. You're right. I, I also know that with the liberals, but I haven't read this one before. And I thought uh, normally, you know, uh, Alan Lamont is very, uh, very uh, correct with the things that he um, that he puts out there. So that on the side, I thought I'd just put the oaths from there. Normally, I read the oaths from Presence of God Ministry, and I'm going to keep reading from there. Just now. say one more thing. Those who are listening and those who will listen, focus heavily on this next paragraph, because this paragraph is, dev- is devastating and explains a lot of what's going on. Yeah, and you have to keep in mind, Pope Francis took this oath. Oh, I know. No. That's- this big smile. Well, just what I'm reading right now, so I'm going to continue now, okay? <clears throat> I furthermore prom- promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, waste, boil, Slay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wounds of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the walls, in order to annihilate forever their execrable race. That, when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisoned cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the poniard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as, as I at any time may be directed to do so by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Face of the Society of Jesus. In confirmation of which I hereby dedicate my life, my soul, and all my corporal powers, and with, de- uh, and with this dagger, which I now receive, I will subscribe my name, written in my own blood, in testimony thereof. And should I prove false or weaken in my determination, may my brethren and fellow soldiers of the militia of the Pope cut off my hands and my feet and my throat from ear to ear, my belly opened and sulfur burned therein, with all the punishment that can be inflicted upon me on earth, and my soul be tortured by demons in an eternal hell forever. All of which I, name, do swear by the blessed Trinity and the blessed sacraments, which I am now received to to perform and on my part to keep inviolable, and do call all the heavenly and glorious host of heaven to witness the blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, and witness the same further with my name written and with the point of this dagger dripped in my own blood and sealed in the face of this holy covenant. End of the quote. Now he receives the waiver from the superior and writes his name with the point of his dagger dipped in his own blood taken from over his heart. So I'm going to stop uh, right here. It's going on, but uh, we're going to continue later on. But now we have a little bit to analyze, I think. So first of all, Michael, uh, thanks for interrupting me with the Masons. I also thought when I read that, I said, I know that I, I don't know this text with the Masons. I, I knew that with the, with the liberals. Right. Uh, so uh, thank you for pointing that uh, mistake out to me. But, you know, that can happen. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, there's one thing in the beginning, uh, almost in the beginning of this, all that I find very interesting um, for, of what I read right now. And that is something uh, I have to look for now. It, it dealt about um, the Norse. Well, that would be the ch- ch- chapter previous. Uh, no, 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 the chapter where we just were here. Um, Therefore, the utmost of my power is will defend this doctrine of his holiness, right, and custom against all serpents of the heretic and Protestant authority, whatever, especially in the Lutheran of Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and the now pretended authority of the churches of England and Scotland, branches yes. of Ireland and the continent of America and elsewhere. 
where does that lead to? That is the northern part of this earth, right? Or, well, it, we would call a Western civilization or the Western Roman Empire, Western Europe and North America. Well, okay, but it has left out Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal. It says especially Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, oh, yeah. All Protestant England, countries. Scotland, All and North America. So this is the North. All Protestant countries is what he's talking Not about. Not only that, but when Satan was cast out of heaven, he wanted to make himself exalt above the throne of the North. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, interesting point. Yeah, okay. That's the one, that's the connection I just see here, you know? Mm -hmm. It is said about that God is sitting in the North. So why is the Protestant movement, or the Reformation movement, have been in the North? There had to be a reason about that. That's a connection. You say Western world, but I say well, then we have to integrate some other countries also, like, like I said, Italy, Spain, Portugal, whatever. Well, France. all those all those countries mentioned were all movers and shakers of the Protestant movement. Yes, but they were also and they were, they rebelled during or not rebelled, but they part of the Reformation. They broke away. Yeah, from. but they are sitting in the north, and. Uh, I don't know when you when when you uh, take a look at the Bible and uh, you look up the word north. I don't know how many times that uh, that will appear there. But I can have a look, of course, uh, and that will be yeah, well, not quite <laughs> quite a lot. <laughs> um, but but I do remember that about um, uh, about about Lucifer. It was saying. Um, that he will exalt himself above uh, the soul of the north, if I'm not mistaken. Well, yeah, it's a very good insight, and you know, it you know, there's there's some validity to what you're saying because if you really start studying the Bible, connecting the dots with history, and what they're really talking about, you know, a lot of folks have a hard time accepting this, but it, I'm getting to the understanding that it's profoundly. I have it here. It's, it's about Isaiah, the Romans. It's about the Roman Empire that we all sorry live to, in. Sorry to interrupt, but it's in Isaiah fourteen, thirteen. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sight of the north. Huh? And that is what Lucifer said. Isaiah 14, uh, verse 13. In the sight of the north. So, what are, what are you specifically trying to suggest? Well, that uh, apparently the north of the world, of the, the northern part of the world, plays an important role in the Bible. Yeah. Well, where's... Where is uh, the dragon's seat? Uh, Where did it be? Yeah, in the Vatican. Huh? Where is that? That's the northern hemisphere. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, that's the northern hemisphere. But Italy was not of the, one of the countries that was mentioned there already. So I just say I'm going to make this 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 connection to to the northern. I, I just found that an interesting uh, interesting point to read. Well, you know, if you look at that, just go back to what you're saying here, uh, to reaffirm what you're saying. You know, um, if you look at the Norman has Norman has for particular uh, Western Europe, uh, Eurasia, this is where all this comes from. This, uh, you know, we talk about this the satanic system, whether it's the Society of Je uh, Jesuits or Jesus, or as one of my friend calls him, calls him the Society of Satan. If you look at, at the whole history, this whole satanic system does come from that region. So, you know, uh, Rome ruled that whole region you know, uh, prior to the Reformation and after. So, yeah, that's fine. You know, it's so, 
you know, it makes it makes a lot of sense to me than what you're suggesting, um, and that I, I think you're what you're suggesting. Maybe you're thinking that there's there's another place outside of Rome that where Satan dwells, <laughs> the Vatican City. I, I mean, um, I don't know. A lot of folks feel that uh, the dragon has. His, his lair is actually there, the Vatican City itself. So, who, yeah, who knows? I, I, Maybe I absolutely agree. But you know, when when he states in Isaiah, uh, it is in, in verse thirteen, "How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did uh, weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation." in the sides of the north. So that means that in the north, there is this mount of the congregation. Yeah, it's in the north, that it's not Italy then. But it's not. When, when, when you say, when you say mount, we've got to understand that mount, it doesn't mean a mountain. It's a, it's a group of people. It's a group. It's a gathering. It's a, a yeah, and we are, talking, we are talking about heaven and not on, the, uh, not on earth, right? right, right. But we're talking about the sides of the north. I only find it very interesting that... Um, he will be there in the north, and that then in the north you have this uh, Protestant Reformation. Right. I mean, it, it, it's just the thought that came into me right when I'm here. I, I can end this process of thinking now and, and tell you what the outcome is, but I think it's just, <laughs> I think it's just a connection that I make and something to to think about, and even maybe for our uh, listeners to to think about also. Oh yeah, I think I think there is a strong connection. So symbolically at least. Just not me. Yeah. And then of course, yeah, uh keep in mind that uh, also Pope Francis, the actual uh working antichrist at this moment, uh, took this oath. Uh and when you see what um measures they all take to kill all heretics and liberals and Protestants, well yeah. You can really get sick when you read something about this. And then later on comes this part that I was speaking about before, um, about uh, being a cadaver. I will have no opinion or will of my own or any mental reservation, whatever, even as a corpse or cadaver, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope and of Jesus Christ. And that is the thing that I meant in the beginning. They have no meaning of their own. They have no mind of their own. They are actually like zombies. They just act what they have been told. They act as a corpse or cadaver, or as it is stated in Latin, perinde ac cadaver. So... When we go back to the beginning of our broadcast, to the 20 years of education these people receive, with the two years the two years novitiate, then the first vows, then two years philosophy, two years regency, five years theology, then the ordination, five to six years apostolic work, one year tertianship, and the final vows, you have 20 years of brainwashing to become, like said here in the text of the Jesuit oath, to become a cadaver, to become even a corpse, not to think of yourself, not questioning anything that has been told by your superiors. Do you have uh, anything to talk about this last point that I was just reading, or are you going? Uh, shall I continue with the with the old now? Well. Uh yeah, I just I just go continue with the oath. I think uh, a lot of the oath is pretty self-explanatory, don't you? I mean, it's yeah, yeah. It is. <laughs> Here and there, I think it needs a little bit of emphasis because you know you read the words and you understand the words, but sometimes they don't get into your heart or, the, or they don't get really into your brain, and the, that, that's where the. Should I just I, the only thing I guess I would say is that people that really listen to how wicked the oath is and how they're willing to and what they're willing to do. And if you look at that oath and then go back into history and look what happened, say, in Croatia during World War II or all these other examples, mm -hmm. and when they say they're willing to, or the, the Inquisitions, um, 
and you're willing to waste, spoil, flay, strangle, and burn alive. You know, the thing that really bothers me is this, and rip the stomachs and wombs of the women and crush their infants' heads against, against the, wall. the walls, which, by the way, they do do, and they... Oh, uh, St. Bartholomew Massacre. Yeah, and it, uh, it's, it's something to, to really should ask yourself if you have any inclination at all that you think that they might be some good guys out there who are Jesuits, <laughs> you might want to think twice. Because <laughs> anybody that's, that's, that swears this oath has to be under the influence of Satan. There's no other way. There's no way. you Would you sign this oath? I wouldn't. There's I no would, way. I even, if I, even if, I, even if uh, I didn't you know, know what I know now, if I, 20 years ago I wouldn't sign this. I wouldn't sign any blood oath. You know. It's no, sick. even 20 years from here or 30 years, uh, no, I, I wouldn't have done that. Absolutely not. But, you know, I haven't, I haven't been going through 20 years of brainwashing by spiritual exercise of information. That's true. Like these oh, people did. Which, which just leads to this question, what is this, you know, what is the ultimate outcome of becoming, or going through this brainwashing process of spirit, spiritual exercises? To me, it's almost like it's the equivalent of demon possessing someone. Absolutely. You know, it's, there's, it's, no, there's no question about it. I mean, uh, you know, when Bush was asked, when he looked into, uh, he did an interview, and uh, the interview said, when you looked into Putin's eyes, you said, when you looked into Putin's eyes, uh, or you, you saw his soul, uh, what did you see when you looked into the Pope's eyes? And he directly answered, God. <laughs> Yeah, what God did you see in the Pope? You know, that can what? only be that can only be Satan, right? Absolutely, it was not our God, that's for sure. Ah, so this is a very good. <laughs> I mean, this comes from uh, George W. Alcoholic Bush himself, uh, stating, "When I look into the Pope's eyes, I see God. Uh, then he sees the God of this world, and the God of this world is Satan, and, uh, and not the God of the Bible, of course, for the moment. So uh, that says it all." Yes. It so does. when you when you look at the uh, at the eyes of some cardinal bishop and whatever, then you will probably see just the same um, the demons that possess these guys. Because uh, you know we we talk about this here, going through twenty years of spiritual formation, spiritual exercises, education to become a Jesuit that high. We, can you imagine doing that twenty years of your life? How old are you, Michael? Some 43, something about that? I'm 46. 46, okay. So just two years younger than me. I couldn't, I couldn't say I could spend 20 years doing this, and probably you couldn't imagine doing 20 years of this. But imagine that if someone really goes for this for 20 years, then I can understand that people say this, because, or, or even do this and then take this oath, because they are, as stated here in the oath, they have become corpses. Yes. They have become absolutely mindless. Uh, isn't that one of the uh, one of the things of spiritual exercises to shut down the inner voice that you have? You and I, we are normal people. We never stop thinking. We will always have a voice inside of us that thinks about this and thinks about that. And when you do spiritual exercises, the first thing you learn probably we're starting with contemplative prayer, is to shut that inner voice up. I don't have that control over me, and I don't want that control over me, because I know that when I shut that voice down, the other voice that comes in there, I don't want to hear that, because that cannot be the Holy Spirit. That can only be some kind of demon who finds an opening. Yep. And that's the whole idea of the spiritual exercise, to open yourself to demon possession. That's what I see it as. And it's hard to argue at that point. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, it's quite devastating. It's quite sad. And just to think that, that we got a bunch of, basically, like you said, demon-possessed men and women running the world in service of the papacy, in service of the dragon who is Satan. Yeah, the biggest trick of Satan was to convince the world he doesn't exist. Yep. 
Okay. Um, something else, or shall I continue? You can continue. That's okay, fine. I continue. Now, um, I said he receives the waiver from the superior and writes his name with the points of his dagger dipped in his own blood, taken from his heart. Now the superior speaks. Quote, you will now rise to your feet and I will instruct you in the catechism necessary to make yourself known to any member of the society of Jesus belonging to this rank. In the first place, you, as a brother Jesuit, will with another mutually make the ordinary sign of the cross as an ordinary Roman Catholic would. Then one cross his wrists, the palms of his hands are open, and the other an answer crosses his feet, one above the other, the first points with forefinger of the right hand to the center of the palm of the left. The other with the forefinger of the left hand points to the center of the palm of the right. The first then with his right hand makes a circle around his head, touching it. The other then with the forefinger of left his hand touches the left side of his body just below his heart. The first then with his right hand draws it across the throat of the other, and hey, hey Jorg, yeah. I hate to interrupt you, but you're kind of yeah. breaking in and out. Are you on a headset? Uh, yeah. Okay, is it someone that you, that you is it losing his juice? No, it's a USB connected, and I'm holding the cable that it doesn't make some noise. Uh, okay, um, where, where, where shall I start again? Um, I don't know, you don't need to start again, but I just would be, uh, I don't know if you can hear what is happening. It's kind of like, uh, Coming in and out, and still, 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 or is it not uh, it's not any better. So and it just started happening after this last conversation we had. Uh, guess what? Do you have any suggestions? What it might be? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, is, uh, is it, am I still good to listen to, or shall we otherwise break the call and you can call me back in? Um. Well, let's do that since uh, I don't. If the, the guests are still listening, if you just hold on, um, yeah. I'm going to have uh, Jorg hang up, and then I'm going to call him back and Skype and see if, uh, uh, if that helps. So, okay. Because you're, you know, this is an important message, and I don't want it to be all fuzzy and have you do it twice. You know what I mean? So, okay, hang up, and I'll call Jorg back. Okay. Okay. All right, here we go. Hopefully this is the answer. Sorry about the delay, folks. This sometimes happens, as you know, with Skype. Okay. Hey, how's the next Uh, I don't know. Sounds all right for a second. I don't know. We'll find out. We keep get back to reading and we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no. Okay. oh, no. Okay, I'm going to stop this uh, paragraph again, right? Okay. In the first place, you, as a brother Jesuit, will with another mutually make the ordinary sign of the cross as an ordinary Roman Catholic would. Then one crosses wrists, the palms of his hands open, and the other in answers, uh, in answer crosses his feet, one above the other. Jorg, are you rattling something? you holding on to a cord or something? No, but I'm growing a beard. Maybe it's the beard coming against the microphone. <laughs> that could be it. Actually, that could be it. I'd be surprised how that happens. So, um, microphone more up. Can, can you hear me good now? I can hear you. Okay, that's great. Because now I put the microphone up and it doesn't touch my beard. So, let's try that. So, okay. Guest four says. Uh, he, guest four says he can hear all right. So let's go with it. If um, Okay. As long as you can hear me, it's all right. I'm going to continue then. Okay. Then one crosses wrists, the palms of his hands open, and the answer crosses his feet, one above the other. The first points with forefinger of the right hand to the center of the palm of the left. The other with the forefinger to the left hand points to the center of the palm of the finger. The first then, with his right hand, makes a circle around his head, touching it. The other then, with the forefinger, of his left hand touches the left side of his body just below his heart. The first then, with his right hand, draws the throat of the other. 
and the latter then with a dagger down the stomach and abdomen of the first. The first then says Illustrum, the other answers Nicar, the first reaches, the other answers Impious, that meaning which has already been experienced in Ri. Uh, um, we can read that later than the explanation because we haven't read that today. The first will then present a small piece of paper folded in a peculiar manner four times, with the other, uh, which the other will cut longitudinally, and on all of them in the name Jesus will be found written on the head and the arms of a cross three times. You will then be guilty and, and receive within the following questions and answers. I'm going to stop here for the questions and answers. We have this um, in the explained there. Um, that was uh, explained somewhere else, um, and this leads to lustrum, ne- uh, lustrum neca, which is impious, the meaning of which is, it is thus to exterminate or annihilate impious or heretical kings, governments, or rulers. So, that is what they uh, write on here with this, uh, when they say, I am so I hope the sound is all right. Then we're going to continue the last part of this uh, oath, um, and that is just questions uh, and answers. The question is posed by the superior, and the answer is given by the Jesuit who is taking the oath. From whither do you come? the Holy Faith, whom we serve, the Holy Father of Rome, the Pope, and the Roman Catholic Church universal throughout the world, who commands you, the successor of St. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Society of Jesus or the Soldiers of Jesus Christ, who received you, a venerable man in white hair, how, with a naked dagger, I kneeling upon the cross beneath the belt of the Pope and of our sacred order. Did you take an oath? I did to destroy heretics and their governments and rulers and to spare neither age, sex, nor condition. To be as a corpse without any opinion or will of my own, but to implicitly obey my superiors in all things without hesitation or murmuring. Will you do that? Will. How do you travel? The bark of Peter the Fisherman. Whither do you travel? To the four quarters of the globe. For what purpose? To obey the orders of my general and superior and execute the will of the Pope and faithfully fulfill the conditions of my oath. Superior, go ye then into all the world and take possessions of all lands in the name of the Pope. He who will not accept him as the vicar of Jesus and as my regent on earth, let him be accursed and exterminated. End quote, really. Okay. That's it, Michael. Still there? Yes, I am. Uh, It's apparently, everyone else says it sounds good. It just uh, must be on my end. It's all gurgling. So, but uh, it, as far as comment goes about the questions, I mean, you know, who do you serve? Question one, right? And they, <laughs> say, they specifically say I, it's the Holy Father at Rome, the Pope, the Roman Catholic Church, universal throughout the world, who commands you, <laughs> the successor of a St. Ignatius, although that would be the... the the superior general of the Jesuit society. So that's who they serve, folks. They don't serve you first. They could, you're you're a, a great distant second best at at that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. And yeah, with this oath of obedience, the Pope agreed to accept the Jesuit order and founded them in 1540. And then they were forbidden in 1773, just 16 years, uh, no, uh, 26 years later, 
Romans took power in 1798. And in 1840, 1814, sorry, 1814, with the reinstallation of the Jesuit order, they took over the Vatican completely. So in the time between 1773, the founding of the Illuminati in 1776, the fall from the Pope through Napoleon, who was working for the Jesuits, so even they were suppressed, they were still there, and you know, and know your history about Napoleon and all this stuff. When he sent, <coughs> sorry, when he sent General Berthier into Rome to arrest the Pope, who died a year later of poisoning, of course, um, they were still working, and in 1812 they came back, and since ever then, they have absolute 100% control the Vatican. Otherwise, I wouldn't have come back. So they just really work with their OCS, even the eventually heretic popes, as they saw them, are exterminated right now. Yeah. It's a very interesting thing to read a little bit about the Jesuits. And, you know, when you look at um, the 1828 edition of the American Dictionary of the English Language and the 1987 Webster's Dictionary, how a Jesuit is defined, uh, Jesuitism, the arts, principles, and practices of the Jesuits, cunning, deceit, hypocrisy, prevarication, deceptive practices to effect a purpose. I think uh, we, we just we just the oath, and um, well, that uh, that says it all, doesn't it? I say it does. I mean, the first time I read the Jesuit oath, it just shocked me to the core. I was like, I can't believe anybody would even, any grown man would, I could see some little kid playing around doing something like that, but I can't see a grown man actually signing something as sinister as the Jesuit oath. So it's quite shocking that any man would do that. It's, you know, it's, it certainly changes changes the game when you uh, read that oath. It changes the man's to- his perspective totally on who these people are, and if they're willing to sign that oath. And all oh, they'll try to many will try to say that it's not true, it's fictitious, it's a lie. But if you add that oath with what history tells you. And what past behavior has been through these gentlemen and through the organization and through the Roman Catholic Church, you can only come to one conclusion that they it's legit. <laughs> you can only deny that when you have not studied the subject, when you have not studied real history. Uh, when, when, you are, when, you are, when you are ignorant to those facts, then you can always deny that. Yeah. Right. But then you will also then you will also deny that there are no Freemasons and that there are no secret societies and that, that there are absolutely no conspiracies and there never were. Right. Even though almost every movie coming out of Hollywood is dealing with what? Conspiracy, right? Oh yeah. What's a conspiracy? Two or more people conspiring together against something else, against any other, maybe any other person, any other society, any other organization or whatever. The world is full of conspiracies. But of course, they use 9-11 to um, yeah, to misplay conspiracy or conspiracy theory to use that as um, some kind of um, uh, I'll say that curse word or whatever for someone. Oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Blah, 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 blah. I always say well, conspiracy only is a conspiracy theory as long as you don't get the facts on it, as long as you don't start looking into it. And they can try to conceal it as much as they want. They also give us a lot of other things. I mean, in the end that we were able to read the Jesuit oath today, 
it's also to, uh, thanks to the Jesuits, because if they didn't want it to, they probably would have taken it out of every uh, internet site or whatever that has uh, ever, uh, ever been posted. Uh, they probably would take it out of the Congressional Record in the United States of America when it's also supposed. I think it's from 19, uh, 1913, isn't it? House Bill 1523, contested election tickets of Eugene C. Bolivar against uh, those S. Butler, February 15, 1913, pages 23, uh, 30 to 32 16. It can also be found in the book entitled Subterranean Rome by Charles D. Davey, translated from the French and published in New York in 1843. So, there are places where this Jesuit knows is to be found, and uh, if they really didn't want them to find out, or some people at least to find out, they uh, would have taken that away, right? Put it in the vault in the Vatican, somewhere deep in the catacombs. They have, uh, they have so many dead bodies lying there, there's a lot of place for a lot of papers, I think, mm -hmm. to put them up there. And that's what they eventually do. They try to tell their ways, and, uh, you know, they can't take the Bible from us, then, okay, then they falsify the Bible, and they come out with all this new... Bible versions like NIV and uh, New Standard Version, NSV, and then what I don't know what names they all have. So they say, okay, if we can take it, they don't corrupt it and uh, put the people into into despair by not telling them where to find the truth anymore. Yeah, it seems to be a, a standard standard operation for them to do. It makes me wonder too. Uh, we brought up the fact that they're still allowing it because I have the impression that uh, the Jesuits are going to have some kind of role in destroying the church itself and and I wonder if that's why they have that out there too it's, well when you read prophecy you know that uh, the Vatican will be destroyed right it will be destroyed and and uh, that is to me that is the Jesuits will do that. I, I think so too. I think the Jesuits are the ones that are going to actually destroy the bank. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, who knows why? But what is their motive? You know, is it just that they just don't care well, at this point? Because the point, they, no, the point, the, the point is, I, I think the point is that um, they have to. Uh, they have to bring the world into the Luciferian doctrine. And to do that, you have to destroy Christianity with all its roots. Right. Now, okay, the Vatican is the seat of Satan, is the seat of the Antichrist. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, it is, a, it is a merger between pagan Rome and early Christianity. True. So, in a way, Christianity still lives on in the Vatican. And for the real Lucifer doctrine to be implemented in this world, I think that this really has to go 100%. Like a little bit I said in the other shows, uh, a difference between revolution and rebellion. Satan has to rebel on his own church to take it out, to introduce his own church then later on, because the Vatican is just a cover for him. All right. And he wants to come out in the open. I mean, if he wants to be worshipped, it doesn't help that people worship him by not knowing he worship him, or knowingly worship him. And therefore he has to come out of it. And therefore the Vatican has to be destroyed. Very valid point, my friend. Very good. Good stuff. Very good. So. Um, it sounds to me like everyone else is doing okay as far as audio goes. And as far as my end, for some reason, the Jesuits have decided to blur my end. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's up to you, my friend. You know, it's, if you want to start that reading of that book today, this show, or if you want to try it um, another day. Well, I think it would be it would be too much to start that already today. But uh, I want to give a little in introduction into that, and then we're going to do that from the next broadcast on, if that's okay with you. That's fine. That's fine. 
I'm, I'm not trying to shut you down or anything. I'm just saying. No, 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 no. Uh, absolutely, uh, I understand. But we are almost on for two hours, and um, I think that's fine enough uh, to have a broadcast for two hours. We don't have to always go three and three and a half like we did the last times. No, and, I said, uh, you know, this this topic should be enough for people to digest. Yeah. Anybody who hears this Jesuit oath really needs to spend some time sitting, stepping back and saying. And we're asking some fundamental questions like, what kind of person would sign this oath? Is this legit? Uh, what kind of person would sign this oath? Uh, should I be in any way affiliated with people who do sign this oath? <laughs> you know, there's important questions to be asked because... Well, uh, uh, let's, and, and let me say, there's one thing that is maybe a little bit of importance. Uh, we should give the people uh, the links that we read this uh, oath from. Um, that is on the website www.remnantofgod.org. Um, go to that site. Um, the guy who is running this site is called uh, Nicholas. And uh, Present of God Ministry is this site called remnantofgod.org. www.remnantofgod.org. And uh, you go to RCC Exposed and Horrific and the Jesuit Oath, and then you will have the Jesuit Oath as I just read it to you. Um, his website is a gold mine, a gold mine of knowledge for any Christian. And if you have not yet uh, shared with him uh, his Sabbath, um, uh, Sabbath broadcast has a conference room where uh, on every Sabbath, uh, that's my time, I think 7 o'clock in the evening, that must be about 1 o'clock at your time, Michael, where he does uh, the Sabbath broadcast on the Sabbath. And I can only advise you uh, to go there as an internet. Uh, he does very good sermons in there, and you can also have a chat room there and participate. And, very, very interesting. I can really, really advise you to, to serve on that site. And it's, it's a really a gold mine of uh, information that he has there. And from that same site comes uh, a page that he made uh, that is called The Characteristics of Antichrist. And um, this page is about 26 characteristics of the Antichrist. And all the uh, characteristics are explicitly explained then. And this is something that I will do the next broadcast. So um, I will not start this broadcast right now, but I will tell you what it is all about. Uh, I'm going to read the introduction of the site here, and then you know that it will be interesting for you to join us uh, with our next broadcast. So I'm going to read a little bit now. Quote. We now have the benefit of histor historic records at our fingertips today. History is behind us. We have proved the prophecies were fulfilled in the exact years as well as the exact manner the Bible said them be. As Christians, we now need to take the advantage of these historic records. We need to use the history books to prove these facts as to share with those that do not believe. It will bless them. It will open eyes. It will fill God's church. It will make heaven that much better to have them there when heaven starts. Before investigating the prophetic symbols that describe the characteristics of Antichrist, we need to understand that the Word of God tells us how to define symbols in prophecy. 2 Peter 1 verse 20 says that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. According to the Word, Christians are told not to give our own opinion of what the prophetic symbol means. We must allow the word God to define its own symbols. Our private interpretations are useless. For example, the term many waters in prophecy doesn't mean a large lake or ocean. The word woman does not mean an actual woman. There are symbolic images hidden in plain sight so as to prevent the wicked from knowing the truth about the times we live in. If they knew it, they would be more effective in their attack against God's remnant people, and that much more effective in twisting God's word. Truth is, there are 404 verses in the book of Revelation, and out of those 404 verses, 
278 of them carry the bulk of the prophetic message of that book. Did you know that all the 278 of those verses can be found almost word for word in all the other books of the Bible? In other words, the Bible defines itself perfectly. Each symbol in Daniel, Revelation, or any other prophetic book are defined in detail in God's word. So don't let anyone give you their opinion or interpretation. When preaching such things, we must always let the word define the word. That's an easy way to expose false teachers. Just hear what they have to say, and then open the Bible and see if what they say matches up with what the Lord says regarding a certain symbol. So, what does the Word of God have to say about all those symbols that define certain desires, characteristics, and plans of Antichrist? And how does history confirm the prophecy, the prophecy authentic? I'm going to stop right here, but afterwards we continue with these 26 points that identify the Antichrist in the Bible. And as I read there before, there's no question about that that is the way it is. So, Michael, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it right here. I'm going to say thank you very much to our listeners for their attention. Uh, I enjoyed myself again very much, like always. Like always. And um, well, I'm going to see you in the latest uh, next week, yeah. I guess, uh, for another broadcast here, or maybe even earlier. We'll see. Okay. Um, I thank everybody who listens and um, everybody who listens in the future also. I hope you learn something new, especially on this oath, and that you understand what the Jesuits are all about. So, in the name of Jesus Christ, I log off. Thank you very much and thank my Heavenly Father for giving me the opportunity to come on here. Wish you all the best and God bless. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Jörg. And, uh, yeah, folks, uh, you know, Go check out all the all previous shows of yours uh, as well. Um, it's becoming quite popular as far as downloads go. Um, but quite a few people are downloading your shows. So. And uh, it's always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you. And um, uh, tomorrow at 10 p.m. Eastern, God willing, uh, Tom Fress will be leading a discussion on Romanism and the Reformation in 2014. Um, I think it's going to be about flattery this time. Uh, I strongly recommend anybody who hasn't listened to the show on Monday, uh, uh, the paper, how the papacy, uh, as the papal takeover of America is what it's entitled. I strongly suggest you read, you listen to that, download it, and share it with others, and find out what happened to this country um, starting on April 16th through the 20th. 2008. Um, this evening, if anybody's interested, I'm thinking about doing a few more recordings, um, and I'm going to do some more readings out of End Time Deception, and I'm thinking about reading Revelations, Seals, Trumpets, and Bowls. I think that Dave's understanding, interpretation of it is really worth sharing. So. Uh, thanks for all those who joined us, um, and God bless you all, and we will talk to you soon. All right, bye-bye.